Chapter Six of Heroines of Travel by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Peril and Adventure in Asia Minor. Mrs. Scott Stevenson, the author of Our Home in Cyprus, had long cherished a wish to visit Asia Minor when at length her husband, Captain Scott Stevenson, proposed that they should undertake a ride through that part of the Turkish Empire. She had been warned by her friends that the journey would entail much fatigue and many privations, that the people were fanatical and barbarous, that a European lady had never been seen in these countries, that she would be robbed or taken captive, and, in short, that there was little hope of her or her husband returning alive from such an expedition. Landing at Alexandretta on the Gulf of Scandaroon, they set out on the caravan road to Aleppo, and plunging into the country, soon left behind the accommodation for travellers generally found on the coast and in large towns. Mrs. Stevenson's first introduction to a Khan, the only substitute for an inn throughout Asia Minor, is thus described. She had been informed that the Pasha's room would be at her disposal. Judge of my dismay, she writes, when I entered the place to find nothing but four unplastered walls with three windows without either glass or shutters, but only wooden bars to keep out robbers. No fireplace, and but a few grass mats laid on the floor. Such was the Pasha's room, so called because the other apartments were mere cells without a window. The travellers at first thought that it would be impossible to sleep in such an unfurnished place but there was no choice. Wisely concluding that, as they would have to rough it, the sooner they began, the better. They made up beds with blankets and other clothing, and with their saddles for pillows, settled down for the night. On the following morning, they were in some doubt which road to take, especially as they were informed that the mountains on every side had a very bad reputation for brigands. It was thought, however, that the mountain robbers would be afraid to attack them unless they travelled in the night, as so many of them had recently been killed. The travellers decided to take the shortest road. They were much interested in the numerous caravans which they met coming from Aleppo. Strings of camels were seen, with huge bales fastened on either side. These were Bactrian camels, with two humps, long bodies and short legs. The drivers, in long mantles, sandals and turbans, could not repress an exclamation of astonishment when they saw a lady riding on a side saddle. Having to cross a river, on the banks of which a tribe of wild-looking Bedouins were encamped, they decided to ford the chocolate-coloured stream. Mrs. Stevenson's pony was too small to cross with her on its back, so she was hoisted onto the shoulders of a sturdy Arab. Bravely he entered the water, but he had not gone far when, stepping into a hole, they both went down together. I shall never forget, says the traveller, as long as I live, the feeling of the muddy water as it rushed over me. In a second I had scrambled out, of course to the same side I had started from, and was seated on the grass with the water pouring literally in streams from my saturated garments. A horse was then brought, and on this she crossed in safety. Having no means of changing her wet clothes, she had to run about in the sun until they were sufficiently dried for her to continue the journey. 
She was glad when they reached their resting place for the night, where they found a large number of persons belonging to different caravans and camped. Hundreds of fires had been lighted, and around them were Kurds, Arabs, Bedouins, and Turkomans, who had a wild, uncouth look, and who stared surlily at the newcomers as they passed on to the calm. Though very tired, the travellers were kept awake during the greater part of the night by the discharge of firearms. This was the plan adopted by the people of the caravans, that robbers might know they were awake and ready to defend any attack that might be made on their cattle or merchandise. Rising while it was yet dark, the horses were saddled by candlelight, and at four o'clock in the morning they were once more on the way. Their stay in Aleppo was spent very pleasantly, the officials paying them many attentions. Thence they set out for Killis. The weather was very cold, and in spite of her wraps, Mrs. Stevenson was obliged to get off her horse from time to time and run by the animal's side to warm her feet and keep up a semblance of circulation. Four hours from Aleppo, they reached a curious village, which consisted of about a thousand hive-shaped houses grouped at the base of a low hill. The owner of the Khan was a very cautious Arab, who refused to supply the travellers with food for themselves and their horses until he had been paid in advance. Their journey through the Lion Pass over the mountains from Asia Minor to northern Syria was very trying, as they had to spend sixteen hours in the saddle before reaching their stopping place for the night. Before they arrived, the sun had set, and Mrs. Stevenson was so exhausted that she could scarcely retain her seat on her horse. During the last two hours, she slept most of the way, only waking up with a sudden start now and then, as the howl of wolves and the plaintive cry of the jackal sounded unpleasantly near. With a feeling of thankfulness, she says, she rolled rather than jumped off her horse when they came to the Khan, and was very soon fast asleep. On the following day, they made a halt at a Turkoman village, where they were very sullenly received. The men were all thieves and cattle stealers. They were always ready to resort to violence, and had no scruples about killing anyone who resisted them. The travellers were very careful to avoid having any dispute with such dangerous characters, and were glad to get away from them without molestation. Nearer Adana, in the worst part of the road, the travellers met a cavalcade of Circassians. The leader, unwilling to allow them to pass, pushed straight on, and Mrs. Stevenson's horse was thrust off the path onto the ploughed ground, while the man jeered at them in the most insulting manner. Very angry, Mrs. Stevenson cried out in Turkish, Circassian savages, when the English come, you will all be sent back to your own country in chains. On hearing this, they gathered round in a most threatening manner. Fortunately, says the lady, our fearlessness had its effect, for though they used no end of bad words and threatening gestures, they passed slowly on, leaving us in possession of the pathway. I declare, she continues, that even if they had shot at me, nothing could have induced me to have got out of the way for them. When the travellers related the story to the English consul at Adana, he said it was a marvel that the Circassians had not fired on them. He told them that in one instance, 
a Circassian had cut off a peasant's nose because the unfortunate man had not removed his donkey quickly enough out of the way. The road to Kaiserera was found to be one of the worst they had yet come across. About every thirty yards they saw the half-eaten carcass or skeleton of a horse or camel, surrounded by vultures, which had so gorged themselves that they might have been easily killed. In fact, many of these fierce birds seemed to be unable to move from their carrion feast. The keeper of the Khan at Mesaluk was a Zabek, who had belonged to a robber band which had been broken up. Many of these questionable characters were met with. They were known by their dress, which seldom varied. They were well armed, carrying usually four pistols and five knives of different sizes. Though pressed to stay here, the travellers pushed on to the Khan at Sarichek. This was a general rendezvous, and there were thousands of men, horses and mules resting on the ground. In this place, women were so rarely seen that the appearance of the English lady struck the members of the various caravans dumb with surprise. They gathered in crowds simply to obtain a peep at such a rarity and the attendants of the Europeans were regarded as men of importance. They were surrounded by an interesting crowd, eager to hear who and what the strangers were. Their path now lay away from the beaten track, and through a district where there were neither villages nor guardhouses. The mountain passes were infested with robbers, and even the ordinary natives were ready to make an honest penny by appropriating anything they could steal in a quiet way. The attendants, in despair, begged the travellers to change their route. Mrs. Stevenson told them to look at her and see how brave she was. She also told them that her husband could kill twenty robbers. Somewhat reassured, the men started, and soon afterwards they found a guide who said he was well acquainted with the proposed route. At the various stopping places all along the road, the stories of the robbers were repeated, but none of these desperate characters put in an appearance. The guide, however, was rather a tricky customer. After some hours' march, they found that he was leading them into a perfect wilderness. A herdsman whom they met informed them that they were going in a direction opposite to their destination, and making straight for the mountains, which were full of robbers. Indeed, the people who lived in the villages had been obliged to seek homes elsewhere, because the brigands stole their cattle and robbed their houses. There can be little doubt that the intention was to waylay and murder the travellers, for the false guide disappeared and was not seen again. After leaving Kara Hissar, where they were again warned of the presence of brigands in the neighbourhood, they were met in a lonely place by two suspicious-looking men who rode down upon them. Mrs. Stevenson had promised her husband that if any such difficulty arose, she would as far as possible keep out of his way and leave him to act. She felt that such a moment had come, and therefore remained in the background. Without a moment's hesitation, Captain Stevenson rode to meet them, pistol in hand. They were not prepared for such active measures, and after wavering for a moment, they wheeled round and galloped off as fast as they could. One of them fired his gun as he went, but the shot went wide of the mark. Oh, said this plucky lady, how I longed to be a man to join in the chase. As they passed near her in their headlong flight, 
she could not refrain from calling out Kordak, meaning coward. One of the men glared at her, and the second raised his gun and fired. He also called out something, but he was riding too fast for her to hear what he said. Soon afterwards, the travellers arrived at a station where there were soldiers, and the sergeant promised to send some of his men in pursuit of the robbers. There was little likelihood, however, of him moving a finger in the matter. Two days were spent in the Armenian city of Caesarea, and then the journey was continued in an Araba, or wagon. In a very dangerous part of the road, the driver lost his way, and as it was rather hilly, the travellers got out to walk. It was well they did so, for the man attempted to drive down a precipice. The horses lost their footing and gave one long plunge, breaking the pole and splinter bars and dashing headlong down the cliff. The wagon bounded into the air and turned completely over. The driver gave one shriek, Allah! and in a second lay senseless and bleeding. The travellers rushed to his assistance and applied such restoratives as they had at hand, but they saw that he was very seriously injured. The attendant was sent off to the next village for a vehicle, while Captain and Mrs. Stevenson remained with the driver. As the man did not return, and night was fast approaching, the captain determined to go and look for him. Making his wife as comfortable as possible, and giving her his pistol in case she needed to defend herself, he mounted one of the horses and rode off. It was a terrible situation for an Englishwoman to be placed in, alone in that wild region with an apparently dying man. The intense silence was only broken by the moans which now and again issued from his lips. The heat was almost overpowering, and she was parched with thirst. Once she looked up and saw a man on horseback peering down on her from the rock above, but when she pointed the pistol at him, he moved off. Then a string of mules appeared in charge of two Turks, who, in spite of the ladies imploring signs for help, rode on as fast as they could. Five hours of suspense passed, and then she heard her husband's voice calling her, and she burst into tears of thankfulness. He had brought assistance. Men and camels had been obtained, and the lady and the injured driver were conveyed to the village. Here the poor fellow received the best attention they could command, and before leaving him, a present of money was made to pay for the damage done to his Araba. Soon afterwards, he recovered from the effects of his fearful fall, and with a new wagon, was once more ready to ply his calling. The traveller's visit to Konia was full of interest, as they were allowed to see the dervishes in their own college. This was an exceptional favour, as the sheikh was afraid that the presence of a woman might be strongly resented. Mrs. Stevenson's pleading had proved successful in the end. Never before, she declares, had she seen such a heap of riches which positively dazzled the beholder while the carpets put into shade the most beautiful of those she had seen in the bazaars of the chief cities of Turkey in Asia. For the benefit of the visitors, the dervishes perform the dance for which they are famous, and which with them is a religious ceremony. The curious movements of the dancers were very amusing to the strangers, but they were careful not even to smile, for they knew that at least a hundred eyes were fixed sternly on them, watching for the least sign of levity. 
The kindly treatment they experienced at Conia was much appreciated by the travellers. In no part of their journey had they suffered less inconvenience than here in the very heart of Asia Minor, in a town filled with the most bigoted of Muslims and containing the fiercest devotees among the dervishes. Mrs. Stevenson says, We were greatly struck with the natural politeness of the people. I will ever look back with unalloyed pleasure on our stay in Konia. Leaving this place, the travellers made their way homeward by easy marches, and at length reached Kyrenia, their home in Cyprus, in safety. End of chapter 6